First Timothy chapter two. Let's begin back in verse one just to get the context. But my text will be from verses four through six. Again, answering the question, what is salvation? Paul writes, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And it's already, what that means is all sorts of men, all kinds of men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. I believe verse 3 pertains back to verse 1. What is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, that we pray for all sorts of men? Don't let prejudice keep you from praying for men's souls and for the glory of God in their salvation. Uh, it may not always be his good pleasure that we lead quiet and peaceable lives. <laughs> uh, there may be some disruption, but one thing's for sure, in all of it, we're to pray to that end, pray for kings, but then we say God's will be done, however he's pleased uh, to do it. Because it says here in verse eight, who will have all men to be saved. And again, leave the proper interpretation as all sorts of men to be saved, whether it's rich or poor, uh, whatever the, the race, he has a people that he's purposed to save from all uh, tribes and nations and tongues and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You'll have people today saying, well, we believe there's one God, but everybody defines him how they want to. You see, even this scripture doesn't leave that open. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, Christ Jesus. So that excludes an awful lot of professors of God just by that very statement. But that's what the scripture says. And it goes on not only to describe his person, but again, his work. Notice how many times in scripture, in the matter of salvation, the person of Christ is set forth, but also his work. You can't have one without the other. Who gave himself a ransom for all, and again, all sorts of sinners, to be testified in due time. So that's my text for this message, answering the question, what is salvation? You know as well as I do that the words saved and salvation are words often on people's tongues. It passes through the lips of many professing Christians today, just like the word gospel or the word Christ. Have you ever found yourself in a conversation, talking with somebody, they find out that you're a believer in Christ and they assume we're talking about the same thing and they just throw out these terms. Isn't the gospel wonderful? Isn't Christ wonderful? Uh, what, a, what a great salvation. And in one sense you can say, well, I agree, but let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. I remember when my wife and I spent some time in England back in, in uh, 1979. We were at a linguistic school at the time and we sat across from an English couple and I thought we spoke the same language, but you know, one time our daughter needed to have her face wiped, so we went and asked for a rag to wipe her face. Well, they, they were appalled. And uh, they said, well, rag, that's to wipe the floor. What you want is a flannel. And we said, a flannel? Uh, flannel's something you wear to go to bed, it's your pajamas. And they said, no, that's what, that's what we call the wash rag. Is that what you call a wash rag, we call a flannel. So immediately there was a difference. You had all the three months we were there was a constant going back and forth. You don't go up in an elevator, you go up in a lift. <laughs> well, a lift is something we use to, you know, for a mechanical lifting of a heavy object, but not 
not something you go up a second story in. So if there's that sort of distinction between dialects in the world, how much more plainly we ought to be clarifying what we mean by the gospel, what we mean by salvation, better yet, what the scriptures mean by it. All right, so the question that must always be asked is, what, what do you mean? How do those who profess salvation really understand it? Now, some doubtless see it as a promise of reward. I've just, I sat down and thought about all the different encounters I've had with people talking about this subject, and there have been many, but a lot of people think of salvation as a promise of reward. In other words, God will reward me with salvation if I have fulfilled certain conditions. That's the way I was raised to believe. You, you if you get down on your knees and say the sinner's prayer, and quote John 3.16 and truly believe it and mark down that day, God has to save you. That's, that's the way I was taught. We've been told that if we'll just say that prayer and then live right afterward, you gotta really mean it. How many times we told you, you gotta really mean it. Be right and do right, then all be well. That's all you have to do, just keep the faith. And faith has been made the synonym of salvation, when in truth, faith is the fruit of it, is the evidence of it. Just like we read here not uh, just a little while ago in Romans chapter 1, when Paul was writing about salvation here, who was he writing about? He was writing about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, and he says in verse 1, he was called to be an apostle separated under the gospel of God, which he... God had promised a four by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures in the Old Testament. But look at verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I remember, uh, just as I said here in 1 Timothy, wherever salvation is the subject, and you see Christ, or if you're going to see his work set forth. And that's exactly what we see here. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's his humanity. He became a man. That's his person. But here in verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power. He was not made to be the Son of God. He was the Son of God from eternity. But he was declared to be the Son of God with power. How? Through his miracles? Now, people saw his miracles and, and uh, called him Son of Belial, you see. How was he declared to be the son of God? Through his doctrine? You know, people argued with him all the time trying to trap him in his word. The one way that he was declared to be the son of God with power, it says here, is according to the spirit of holiness. You can say according to the Holy Spirit. That, that's The spirit of holiness is the Holy Spirit who declares him, reveals him. And it says here, by the resurrection from the dead. What's that? His work. In other words, he was raised from the dead because as the Savior, the God-man, he accomplished salvation there at Calvary. And the proof is, you want proof? Well, God raised him from the dead. God would not have raised his son from the dead had he not satisfied every jot and tittle, every condition. So you see, Scripture sets Christ forth as salvation. It's just like old Simeon when he went to the temple that day and took that little baby in his arms. The Spirit of God, there's that Spirit of holiness that declared to him who he was. And he took him in his arms and says, now I can die, he says, because I've seen thy salvation. Same thing with that thief on the cross. See, all sorts of sinners. You might say, well, Simeon, you know, the Lord drew him to the temple. Well, here's a, here's a thief on the cross, ready to die cursing this one and suddenly changes his tune. What happened? Spirit of holiness. Holy Spirit declared to his soul who this was. And he said, remember me when you come in your kingdom. That's, that, that's what this is all about. It's, it's God opening sinners' eyes to see Christ as salvation in his person and his work. And, and sinners whose eyes have been opened, they're not looking to their experience 
It's like when I sit down to eat, I'm not thinking about how hungry, how good it feels to be hungry. Although hunger is a sign of life, and I'm thankful there's hunger. I've been there's been times when my wife will say, "Well, do you want to eat something?" And I'll say, "No, I, I just I throw it up." That, but when there's food in front of you, where's your thought on that food? It's just like where where there's hunger, it's toward an object. Christ is that salvation, and that's how He set forth in Scripture. But many think it's something they do, and and we've been wrongly trained this way. How many got saved last night? <laughs> You heard in meetings, you know, so so many got saved last night. What does that mean, got saved? What they mean is they walked an aisle, they said a prayer, they raised their hand, they did something that the preacher told them to do. And some of, the, some of them probably did it because they, got, they wanted to go home. <laughs> Let's get this thing done so we can get on out of here because preachers will wear them out. They'll wear them out. But others see salvation as something that, on the other extreme, cannot be known for sure in this life. Have you ever dealt with people that way? I have. Years ago, up in up in Michigan, there was a group that if you ever stood up and and professed that you believed the Lord had saved you, they would call that presumption. They would say no sinner can say for sure that he's been saved. So th there's the other extreme. You got over here people that are saying they're sure it's their own name they're saved, and then over here you got people. You know, just saying, well, this isn't something that we can know for sure in this life. So they, they trudge life's pathway, doing the best they can, and hoping that in the end God will show them mercy for at least giving it their best shot. And I, we work with people. I do this way. When you start talking to them about this, they, they say, well, you know, all I know is I'm, I, I hope when I, when I die that the Lord will be, you know, he'll, he'll receive me. And I, all I'm trying to do is give it my best shot. Well, you've got to tell them that's not salvation. That's not salvation. Others that we've dealt with make it a cooperation between what God must do. They'll, they'll readily say, yeah, God has his part. But they'll also make the necessary condition for it being realized to depend upon you. It's almost like a contract. Here's two spots to sign. God has already signed his. Now what are you going to do with it? That's often how salvation is presented. Uh, they'll say, here's what you have to know and believe, and yet, here's what you have to do to prove it. It could be a decision, it could be a walk. There's some condition that, that men will, will put on it. Even in, in Calvinistic circles, you'll hear, you'll hear and read of writers who say, well, our justification is before God, that's, that's God's part, but our walk in sanctification, that's ours. And they say that the, the two of those, I've heard it mentioned like two, two handles on a plow. You've got to keep both handles on the plow, both hands on the plow. Well, salvation is not a plow. <laughs> it's a person. And uh, our, you know, it's like it says in 1 Corinthians 1.30. I quote it often, but who's made unto us wisdom. I believe when, this, when the Spirit of God has made Christ wisdom to somebody, they see him as their salvation. He's, he's our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. That he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now having said that, as I studied this text here for this message, I see three answers that the inspired word gives us in answer to this question, what is salvation? And you can see why this is necessary. There's just so much confusion. People mean well, but there's confusion. But I would say this, I'll just give you these three answers, and they come right out of these three verses, four, five, and six here. If someone were to ask you, what is salvation? Well, 1 Timothy 2, 4, salvation is the knowledge of the truth. It says here, who will have all men to be saved, and that word and can also be translated even, to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So that means that salvation is in connection with the knowledge of the truth. It has to do with revelation. The word salvation means deliverance. And there's nobody that can say that they're saved apart from the knowledge of the truth. There's a, there's a revelation of Christ who is the truth. Now that doesn't mean there's, there's a perfect understanding. We continue to grow, but it, as the Lord teaches us, where there's been salvation, 
there's going to be an aligning of our thoughts and wills and affection to this word, to, to how Christ is revealed. So how the Spirit reveals him to the heart is going to be in conjunction with how he's revealed in this word. And that's why you can challenge people when they talk about salvation in a way that is contrary to this word. I don't care what their experience is. It's not a matter of just saying, well, I had this experience. People have religious experiences all the time that are not in, the, in connection with the truth. And so that's why we open this word. That's why we, we weigh it together, because in it is revealed the truth, the knowledge of the truth. And we continue to bow. We continue to bow as the Spirit teaches us. Secondly, in verse 5, what is salvation? Well, we can say that salvation is entirely the work of God the Father through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as mediator. You can't talk about salvation apart from talking about this, this covenant between the Father and the Son. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. See, we always like to insert ourselves. <laughs> but you notice in, in every one of these verses, the sinner is the one who has been acted upon. Not the one acting, but the one who has acted upon. For example, even here it says, who will have all men to be saved, all sorts of men, of sinners to be saved, even to come under the knowledge of the truth. Well, how does one come but what God wills it? Christ said that no man can come except it be given him of the Father. So it's being acted upon. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If you're out there drowning, you're desperate. You're helpless. Unless someone delivers you, you will perish. And so here comes the deliverer, takes you and brings you up on shore and, and uh, puts you into safety. Are you going to stand up and say, boy, didn't we do a good job together? It's like the mouse that rode across the uh, bridge, uh, walked across the bridge on the back of the elephant. And when it got to the other side, the mouse said, didn't we shake that bridge? It's crazy. But here again, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. It's not the, man, it's not the men that are being exalted here. It's the man. But how many times... In, this, in describing salvation, you'll hear people talking about what you have to do. Well, I'm being acted upon. This is a work done on my behalf. If it required a mediator, it must mean then that I was at odds. There was enmity. That's when you call in a mediator. You know, you'll see these, these shows on TV when they start questioning a person and the guy will finally say, do I need to hire a lawyer? All of a sudden it dawns on him, I am, I'm being charged here. I'm being pursued. Well, the, for, for sinners, there's no question. It, unless God himself has established the mediator, there's no hope. There's no hope. And then the third answer to what is salvation is down here in verse 6. Salvation, it says, who gave himself a ransom for all. Salvation has been accomplished and fulfilled through the doing and dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just Christ the person, the man Christ Jesus, but it says there, notice there's no period, who gave himself a ransom for all, again, for all kinds of sinners to be testified in due time. So let me just, that, that's briefly the answer, and that's the message. And let me just develop this just a little bit more for a few minutes here. Let's look at this in verse 4. Salvation in connection with the truth uh, first of all, the truth is that salvation, of which the scriptures speak, is, is based upon God having willed it. You know, we always hear about man's will. You know, I just wrote somebody this week who's been getting our bulletin, I don't know for how long, but uh, all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, they wrote and said, I've been reading what, you, what you're saying, but I know that man has a free will. Uh, she didn't want to talk about God's will. She was taking exception to it and trying to defend man's will. That's, that's what you'll find people often doing. You spend time, too much time talking about God's will with them and, and you'll find out in a hurry whether they really believe it because they want to interject man into it. Well, I wrote back and told her, man has a will, but it's not free. 
It's bound by sin. It is already, that will has already been condemned in court, in God's court. So you can say what you want to about it and try to spruce it up and, and put some value to it, but God has already written a death sentence on it. So that's why we talk about God's will, if the judge be pleased. I don't know. There's cases like that where, where you walk in, you don't know what the judge is going to decide. You know you're guilty. You know everything. You deserve the, the sentence and the condemnation. It's up to the judge to determine the case. And that, that's, that's the way it is in salvation. The salvation which God wills that sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue should enjoy when it says who will have all men to be saved. It's talking about all kinds of, of men. This isn't just a mere possibility of salvation. It says there who will. God does what he wills. It's not just a mere putting of them into a savable state. Some people say, well, God makes them savable, but they still have to do something. No, this isn't just an offer of salvation to them. It's not a proposal of sufficient means. If you'll just, you know, you've, you've heard that. If you'll, just, if you'll just go down to the bank and get it out, it's already right there. But if you won't go get it, then you're going to perish. That, that's often how it's, how it's presented. But that's not how it's stated here. It's stated that it's a certain, it's a real, it's an actual salvation which God has determined that sinners should have by his own appointment. We can say that, can't we? This is the will of God, that sinners be saved. I, I know I've made that statement in the past where God could have just condemned everybody to, to hell. No, <laughs> there's his mercy, there's his grace that is every bit a part of his attributes as his, as his wrath and his justice. So we know that from eternity, God purposed to save the people in a just manner because he's a merciful God. But it's by his appointment. It's by his appointment. It's by, and secondly, it's by the satisfaction of Christ as their savior. It, it's not just by decree. That's what I want you to see here in, in verse Four, who will have all men to be saved, all kinds of men to be saved. But it's not by decree, because it goes on to say in verse 6, who gave himself a ransom. There's no question that God appointed it, but it's the means was the, by the satisfaction of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's by grace, in which everything necessary is, is purposed, but it was to be affected by a mediator, by a person, by a savior. And so that's what this is saying here in this, in this verse. When it says who will have all men to be saved, it's evident that it's not, it's not meaning every single person to be saved, because if that were the case, then you'd have to say God's a failure, because there's a multitude, broad is the way that leads to destruction. There's a multitude of sinners that'll never know salvation. And, and, you know, this is where we have to be brought to bow to bring our will, be, our will be brought in subjection to, to God's because uh, we can't just say, well, God save him. We can pray that the Lord might be merciful. We can pray that if it be his will, that he be pleased to, to save sinners, but it's not an obligation. And so quite often we're brought to just to, to bow to whatever your will is, Lord, whether it's our children, whether it's loved ones, acquaintances, those are some of the hardest ones to, to submit to because we, we would love to see the Lord do his work, but we know what he said. He, he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And uh, many times in a family, you'll have one or two that he's been pleased to deliver out, and the rest, he lets them go their way. But this will of God, it's not, you know, some people try to say, well, there's his decorative will where he decrees and then there's his permissive will. He really would like everybody to say, be saved, but finally he, you know, he chooses to save those who believe. Well, you know, I've often said if from eternity God saw that some would not believe if that were the basis, then why did he create them? He still made a choice. He still made a decision. We know that it's, it's by his ordaining. In Acts chapter 13, 48, it says, As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. 
Yeah, we can't get that backwards. It doesn't say as many believed were then ordained to eternal life. No, as many as were ordained to eternal life believe. So the will of God here is that sovereign will that cannot, will not be frustrated. When it says who will have all men or all sorts of men to be saved, it means that all those that he purposed to be saved will be saved. Otherwise, what does the will of God have to do with salvation? Just to wish it. That'd be like us. We wish many things that never come to pass. But that, that shows our impotence. But not God. Not God. Every one that he's purposed to save, he'll have. All right? But notice it's in conjunction with the knowledge of the truth. That's what I want you to see here. It's not, we're not just talking about theory here. He will have all men to be saved. That's what gives us encouragement to go out and preach the gospel to all sorts of men. And, and this is where you have to be careful because in religion it tries to get everybody marching to the same beat of the drum. You can see certain groups. You can tell almost what group they're from because of the way they wear their hair, how they wear their dress, color of their clothes. They're, they're, they're trying to fit everybody into a pattern. I'll tell you where the truth of, of, of salvation comes in is where you find a group of people rejoicing you know, been made to worship God in spirit and truth and rejoice in who he is and give him all the glory. And yet, as you sit down and talk to them differently, they're all different. When you ask one to pray, he's not praying like the other one. It's not, there's not this, it's not mechanical. And this is where preachers, they, they get an organization going and they run everything through this plan and through this organization, this master program. And, uh, you know, it, in exactly what it's like a uh, it's like a factory. Everything spits out the same way. That's not how the spirit works. Even in Scripture, look at the difference in the writings of these men between Moses all the way to John. You see their personalities. It's the spirit working through them, but it's the spirit. You see, and here this matter of of uh, all to be saved. How is it evidenced? How do we know? Well, it says, even to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And you can put there, if you, if you will, instead of truth, Christ. The knowledge of Christ. To come to the knowledge of Christ. In other words, there's a growing in it. There's a continual coming. There's a continual learning. Christ said, come unto me, all that ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and what? Learn. Learn. We continue to learn. Uh, that's why I don't think we can get caught up with, well, at what point can I say I was saved? Well, I was saved when the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life for my, for my sin. But I'm continuing to be saved as he's given me a, a light of the knowledge of his person and I shall be saved. I know that in that day, when I, when I die and I breathe my last breath and my eyes are open in glory, he's not going to be any different than what was revealed right here in this world. Word. And I continue to come to knowledge of him. I truly believe that even through eternity, we'll continue to learn of him. Angels that never fell, the scriptures say they look into these things. They don't have all knowledge. They, they look into these things and marvel and wonder. So there's a, there's a learning that takes place, but the object, the subject is Christ. And the coming to him is a continual coming to the knowledge of the truth. And as the Lord teaches us, you know, it's, it's like life. You begin as a babe. You know more today about life than you did when you were born? I hope so. Otherwise, something's wrong. How about when you were a teenager? We thought we knew everything when we were teenagers. There was life, but boy, we, we had to learn. But even now, you get, you get midlife and not up in years, and you think, well, I've learned everything until what? The next trial comes along. And then you find out you don't know anything. <laughs> Whatever progress you thought you had, you are brought low again. It's almost like starting over. We keep going back to kindergarten. We're learning. Even these things pertaining to, to the gospel, to Christ, to our justification before God. As, as we study the scriptures and he makes them plain to our souls, we, we know and understand 
All the glory goes back to Christ. We think we're giving them all the glory until we learn some more. And then all of a sudden we realize, well, there was an area I wasn't giving them the glory. So we bow. We continue to bow. And thankfully, it, the Lord does not deal with us. This is a point I want to, want to make. He doesn't deal with us on how much we know. He deals with us on the basis of his son's knowledge. <laughs> Isaiah 53 says that by his righteous servant, by his knowledge shall he justify many. That, that's, that's why any are saved. It's because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as those that the Lord is, has saved by his son, he causes to come under the knowledge of truth and continue to come. Secondly, verse 5, salvation is entirely the work of God the Father through the Lord Jesus. Again, we see here the work of the, of, of the triune God. There's the Father, there's the Son, and the Spirit. And the Father is the one who had to be satisfied. That's how he's represented in Scripture. You say, well, they're one. Well, there's three persons in one Godhead. And I believe this also is set forth to help us understand this matter of salvation. There's a, there's a just God that had to be satisfied. There's a, a just Son the just one is the way the scripture set him forth. Who satisfied? He, he's the one set forth to be that mediator. Uh, any religion that, that tries to put angels in there, tries to put saints in there, tries to put Mary in there, it's, it's idolatry. It's false worship. It says here there's one God and one mediator between God and man. See, I'm not even, I'm not the mediator. You have to tell people all the time, don't look to me. You know, they can come to you with their requests for prayer and, and ask for consolation and, and maybe some direction, but all I can do is point you to Christ. There's one God, one mediator. I like the way that's put, and men. That's a term that describes men. Again, in a very generic way, not all men. Not every, there's, there, God has not established Christ to be the mediator of every single sinner. If he did, then every single sinner would be saved. He's the propitiation, not for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world, John said. But again, there, what's he talking about? Not just for the Jew, but for the, the Gentile, men. That's how that's described. But look how the difference, the man, who's the mediator? The man, Christ Jesus. You know, we, we have to, we believe that he's, he was God, 100%, the Lord Jesus Christ, but at the same time, he was man. Had to be. He had to be one who could lay his hand on God, because only God can satisfy God. And yet, at the same time, he had to be a man in order to represent men as their substitute, you see. So, the God-man. But it's entirely his work. That's what I want you to see here in verse 5. Salvation entirely the work of God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because God willed it and Christ paid for it. It's like in a will. You know, the testator has to die, but someone has to put your name in it. My children are beneficiaries whether they know about it or not. There's probably a lot of things they don't understand about a will. They're not even thinking about it now. But if... If the Lord should take me out, take my wife out, there's a, there's a legal document that, that instructs the state as to how that inheritance is to be distributed. But it's not, going to be, it's not going to be theirs. It's theirs, but the reality of it isn't accomplished until the death of the testator, you see. And so that's what's set forth here, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the truth of, of eternal his eternal purpose to save sinners. No question, that's why I never say, but I'll tell you, it's all tied to, to his doing and his dying. The man, Christ Jesus, the God-man. And salvation stands or falls on, on who he is and what he accomplished. And so that brings us to verse 6 here, where it's the third answer to this question, what is salvation? Well, it's been accomplished. I like that. Salvation accomplished and applied. 
It's already been accomplished and it's already been applied. You say, well, what about when the Spirit uh, regenerates you? Well, it, that's not when it's applied. That's when it's revealed. <laughs> it's declared to you. But this thing was settled when the Lord Jesus Christ died, who gave himself a ransom for all. Well, what's a ransom? Well, it's a payment. See, there's a difference in Scripture between a ransom and redemption. We get those confused sometimes. The ransom is the payment. That's the price. Redemption is the result. So where a ransom has been paid, maybe among men, you, can, you always hear scenarios where a ransom was paid, and then they still deliver back a dead body, whoever took the hostage. And so the, it wasn't honored. Someone paid the ransom, and yet the, the person ended up dying anyway. Not with God. All those for whom the ransom is paid or has been paid have been redeemed. But redemption is the result of a ransom having been paid, satisfaction being made. And so it says here, who gave himself a ransom for all? We like to talk in theological terms sometimes, but when I read here, what the mediator gave as a ransom for men, for sinners, is himself. Himself. But you can't have any greater ransom than that. His body, his soul, he was subjected to the guilt of the sin of those for whom he died, and God punished him as if he were the sinner. Sin was charged to his account, and he died under that charge. But you know what? Because it was a, a true ransom and one that satisfied the holy God, that means then God is just to charge to the account of everyone for whom Christ died, charge to their account, account his righteousness. And that's really, you know, uh, men try to complicate this thing, but that, to me, as I understand the scriptures, where salvation is. That there, there, it's in that transaction that took place between God the Father and God the Son when God charged his Son with the sin of his people. And having, having laid that to his charge, God and the ransom paid, God could justly now charge to the account of those for whom Christ died, charge that very righteousness, and call it the righteousness of God. That's what it's called in Scripture, the righteousness of God. Why? Because God accepted it. It's his. He ordained it, Christ accomplished it, and God accepted it. And you know, as the Lord teaches you that, that's the thing that brings peace to the conscience. That's what brings peace to the soul. Knowing it's not something I have to do, but it's something that's been accomplished on my behalf. And I have to deal not with a God of wrath, but a God of, of mercy, because justice has been satisfied. I don't believe you'll ever have peace in your soul until the Lord teaches you that. It's just, if it's based on any other thing, there's always going to be that time when you're going to be brought to doubt. And you should, because if you're not looking to Christ, there, you have every reason to question it. But knowing salvation's in him, there's, there's no doubt, no question. And it says here to be testified in due time. There's a couple of ways that that could be, could be understood where it says to be testified in due time. It could be talking there about how he's revealed. He died, he accomplished it, and yet even now, he is being witnessed to in due time. In other words, God's time. At the time when the Spirit is pleased, the Spirit is going to cause everyone for whom Christ died to know him and be brought to him and believe. I had a man ask me that a couple of weeks ago, called me up and said, I hear what you're saying about justification before God and it was accomplished on the cross, but do you believe that any for whom Christ died will die in unbelief? And I said, absolutely not. It's justification unto life is the way the scripture says it. All that God has justified through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to cause to know it. They're not going to wake up in, in glory one day and think, oh, I was one of the ones for whom Christ died. They're going to be made to know it, testified in due time. And uh, you can see how it follows. How? Through the preaching. I don't try to go around and, and, and tell people, well, you're justified, you're justified. That's not my job. How's it going to be manifest? It's going to be manifest in due time through the preaching of the gospel. Paul said, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and line up, declaring Christ. 
setting Christ forth. That's, that's all my responsibility is to tell sinners where salvation is. It's in the work person of Christ and it's in his work and to command them to bow. And you know what? As the Lord grants sinners to bow and to know him and their mouths are stopped and they recognize themselves as sinners, worthless sinners, but Christ is all, uh, there's, a, there's the manifestation in due time of what Christ has accomplished. It, the mystery is going to be revealed. All, all these things in, in, our, in men's minds that they tried to sort through themselves suddenly <laughs> begin to come together. And there's an understanding, there's a bow, there's a submission, there's a work of grace that affects your mind, continues to affect it, bring it into submission to the word, affects your will, you stop fighting these things, you know, you stop struggling with it, and affection. You begin to love them. And you wonder how you could have loved them before when you knew so little, but now you love them, you, you, you love them all the more, and you continue to love as the Lord is pleased to teach you. Whom having not seen, we love, is what Peter said. Whom having not seen yet, we believe. We believe, but we don't glory in, in our believing. We glory in him who did the work and, and caused us to believe that we might know him. That's probably the best way I know how to describe uh, the salvation of, of scripture. And I hope that we can rejoice in it.